<laughs> this week's not happening. This this week's gonna be slick. I tell you, this week is gonna be beautiful. I tell you, I can already smell the smoke of the engines falling apart. Like I've already got the fire extinguisher on standby. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, welcome to Cool Story Bro. We're on ep- was this episode four? It is episode four, I believe. Can I just say that is a it. whole month of the Sneaky Bros committing to content. Uh, is that a round of applause? I mean, come on. Is it just me clapping on this? Is it just me? Come on. This I, is awkward. Want, I don't want to pop the microphone. <laughs> 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 yes, yes, we're 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 here. Month. Um, we're committed a month to content, so how's it going? Welcome, we're gonna cue the intro. Do it. Press that button. <laughs> yes, welcome to Call Story Bro, the podcast where we talk about games. Uh, we don't really know what we're doing, but we do it anyway. Uh, of myself, Sneaky Vale, one of the Sneaky Bros, joined, of course, by my brother, Ziklag. Hello. How you doing? And this week, joined by our guest, uh, his wife, Europa. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. So, I've got to be on my best behaviour this week, otherwise I will be sleeping on the couch, and you're going to hear it here <laughs> first on the podcast. Can, can I just say we've got a grill on the podcast? A real a grill? grill? Yeah, we've got more of a diversity going on here, so, you know, we're going up in the world. Indeed, indeed. Uh, so, our second guest on the podcast. Um, a bit awkward your wife wasn't the first one, just saying. Um, anyway, are you, moving on. Are you trying to ruin me? Are you, are you, are you, are you trying to ruin this relationship? <laughs> well, you're already in different rooms to film this, so you might as well, you know, <laughs> stay that way. No, you're breaking the immersion. We're all in the same studio. <laughs> oh, we are, we are, we are. We, I, I fly across the world every week to record this podcast live from Sneaky Bro Towers. Welcome. How are you doing? Uh, I, I think it's worth. Tower. I think it's worth saying, actually, uh, a good gaming story. Uh, Ziklag uh-huh. and Europa, you met through playing games. Let's talk oh, about that. Is, yeah. This, this is, is a good story. This is a good story. It's, it's a good story, is it? Uh, I don't know, like, I've told it to a few people before. Um, sometimes we change our story a little bit because we don't want to embarrass ourselves because of how much of sad degenerates <laughs> we really are. But we met on the game Damned, you know, where, you know, it's it's one of those horror games where four of you are trying to survive and trying to escape these rooms or these maps. And there's one, like, uh, ghostly or, like, uh, hideous horror creature that's trying to stalk you in a, and and, like, kill you. And at the time, myself and shout out to Verlaine from Four Four Games Not Found, uh, we were recording together. We were, we were playing some damn together, having a good time, and we came across this grill uh, <laughs> called Kittens at the time. Kittens at the time. And uh, me being the uh, degenerate that I was, I was just focusing on doing nothing but to scare her. And she got scared. <laughs> and then we got you you did that, that thing. You saw a girl's name in game, and you focused on that, didn't you? Listen, I told you not to bring up this story ever, and here we are. So, you know I'm a degenerate, all right? So, let's just, like, get past this story. <laughs> I've, I've got to ask, though, Europa, be, being a female gamer, how many times after games do random guys add you? Uh, you know, it still happens every day. It <laughs> At least really one, is. because I did it. <laughs> <laughs> and you were one of them, and she gave in. What, what, was, what was different was about this random sweaty nerd that made you change your mind? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, calm down. Uh, I don't know, he was really funny and he wasn't super creepy like the rest of them. <laughs> Until. That's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I, was a, I was there 24-7, <laughs> pressing call, paying, hey, please talk to me, grill. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's the story, uh, briefly, of how... Uh, Ziklag and Europa Matt. Um, yeah, so oh, yeah. we're going to move on uh, to the news this week in the podcast. Uh, yeah, uh, there's been quite a lot of news this week, actually. Some really, really good stories, which is good because it means we get content. Um, 
Okay, I'm, I'm going to fire this out there this week. We've all probably loaded up Steam this week and uh, seen their shiny oh, yeah. new feature. Um, they've re- they were this. It was slated that they were going to redo the whole of Steam and all this lot, and they've pushed out this update. And I thought it was coming, and they've redone. I thought it was just the friends list they're redoing, but they've not redone the friends list. They've done the the voice communication side of the friends list, so they've yeah. half redone the friends list. Basically, okay. what Steam have done of try to push into the Discord market, in my opinion, very badly. It looks a little bit flashier than their old friends list. Uh, other than that, it's not great. Why push into a market that Discord already dominates? I'm unsure why they're putting a resource into that. I think the whole friends list system does need an overhaul, and in fact, people won't like change, but I think the whole Steam system does need a little bit of tweaking and updating because it is out of date. Like, for example, uh, we play a lot of Rocket League. If I'm using a, a controller and I want to invite people to the party, I, I press X, as it is on my controller, to open up the invite friends. I then yeah. I then can't move around with the controller to select. I have to then what? use the mouse. Yeah, yeah, the the control I have doesn't doesn't scroll through the friends menu on Steam, uh, so it's little things like that that I think they should be focusing on, not trying to push into this Discord market, which everyone's jumped on straight away. Like, stop trying to be like Discord. Discord do it so well. Not only did you try um, without using your Steam controller for Rocket League. Um. I would never use my Steam controller for any video games ever. It was probably was probably not the best purchase. I um, I think the ideas behind the Steam controller are very good. The execution is very poor. I um, even tried to play Formula One uh, 2017 with it, and it really, really just isn't reactive. Plugged in my Xbox controller, and straight away... Everything is just intuitive. I love it. Uh, Steam Control, it's okay. It, it's not too bad, but uh, uh, it was not the best way to spend thirty-five pounds. So... From the looks of it, it's it's like they were trying to do something new with it, but yeah. then it just didn't seem, no, seem to do anything no, but go backwards. I do no, I do. C- I do commend Steam actually for trying to push things forwards rather than uh, stick with. Uh, you know, old and tried and, and things. I, you know, Steam are good at pushing the boundaries of stuff, maybe a little bit slowly, but uh, no, I, I think it was <laughs> worth them for uh, f- for trying that. And uh, anyway, but so the friends list is part of the new rework that's uh, coming to the whole of uh, Steam. Uh, a lot of people online saying, why fix things that weren't broken? Yeah, it wasn't yeah. broken, but Steam does look very dated at times, um, and they do need to tweak things up. Um, I can see the memes now when they change the front page of Steam because they're going to slick it up and no one's going to like it because nobody likes change. We'd all just like to just stay in the past. Well, yeah, we're still playing RuneScape every now and then. I can't believe I've just brought well, the game up. Again. Uh, and everyone just plays old school RuneScape because they don't like change or microtransactions. Much, yeah. Nuts. But yeah, um, when that Steam update happened, my first thought was, how do I opt out of this beta? And then I realized it's not a beta. <laughs> it's, not a it's been in, it's been in beta for a while, and uh, the, the testers apparently liked it. For people who don't use Discord, it will be very good. But the majority of people already use Discord because Discord's marketing is fantastic without sounding like a, an advert for Discord. Their tongue-in-cheek advertising works no, keep and it because sits we need, well with gamers we need, yeah, we need that sponsorship hey uh, you can we've already with discord. broken already yeah we've already broken ties of steam just now so <laughs> hi discord <laughs> um but yeah it's um yeah it's not a market they should be pushing into when someone's so dominant at the moment um they should let them just just take the reins unless they come up with uh, an innovative twist on it which they haven't all they've done is slicked up their dashboard ever so slightly and decided to add a feature um, that's already existing in an other piece of dominant software. League of Legends did yeah. the same. They added VoIP. Um, they should have done that five years ago, before yeah. Discord was king, and it would have been great. But it's not needed. And, okay, fair play to developers that work on this. It is good to have these extra features in, but when something's so dominant that you know everyone else uses, why bother? You so, know what? The... 
The um, the VoIP in League of Legends is actually really good. It's really the, good. the it's quality really good is absolutely abs actually fantastic because VoIP in other games like Rocket League, for example, they've realised there's no need for them to develop their VoIP systems. So it's actually one of the worst VoIPs I've ever heard in game. Um, but they know that. Uh, but they don't mind because they know everyone uses other systems and they're fine with that. And that's very good. Uh, we were speaking about controllers. Uh, we might as well move on to the next piece of news. Uh, I, I imagine it's something that everyone expected, but Nintendo Switch is getting GameCube-style controllers, uh, which will be released in October. Obviously, this is done just before the release of Smash Brothers, because all the pro players <laughs> will want a GameCube-style controller. Yeah, um, this is... I'm super um, excited for that. Yeah, yeah this is Smash is going to be great. This isn't really a big surprise. I mean, you know, we all saw this comment eventually. There were other uh, slightly different controllers that were coming out. Uh, you know, they did the job, but this controller looks a hell of a lot better. Well, they've got three different <laughs> themes. They've got the Mario, the Zelda, and the Pikachu coming out. Actually only slated to release in Japan at the moment, but we know that they're going to be released elsewhere, whether Nintendo do it officially or others others take over. Europa, you were going to say? Some, uh... There's some pretty good third third party controllers as well that are already out for the Switch. I think. Yeah, um, I, I think people really want that game to controller back still. Yeah, I I don't think the the third party controllers that I've seen, I don't think they're they're going to be quite as good as the the ones that Nintendo are going to be releasing. Um, they're a little clunky, a little big. It's so a. I'm, it's a very iconic piece of controller as well, isn't it? Like, everyone's used it at some point. Yeah, it, the um, Nintendo uh, GameCube controller actually is a divided opinion. A lot of people either love it or they think it's the worst controller in the world. Me personally, I think it's the best controller, and still to this day, the best controller I've ever played with. For the time really? it was released, it was so ergonomically designed, it fitted well in the hand, and I just love it. It's simple, it does the job. The back buttons are a little bit clunky, but you know at the time, you kind of got used to it. I mean, you'd get some serious RSI if you were using like the back buttons all the time. <laughs> but I think it's... I, I also say this because I'm nostalgic about the GameCube because it was like the first console um, that we had. And yeah, I think that's more why I think it's my favourite controller because I'm a little bit nostalgic about it as well. What, why, what Do, would you uh, say your favourite controller was? Um, uh, me personally, I would probably say the 360 just because it was quite chunky on the end so it like fit on my hand really well. But I was going to touch upon that Nintendo, you know, the GameCube controller was kind of like the most innovative controller that you could possibly think of because Microsoft and Sony then copied that kind of two analog sticks, one slightly raised up with the two back buttons. You know, it, you know, the other controllers kind of saw that and went, yeah, it works very well. Let's innovate it slightly differently and make it work for us. So, yeah. you know, it's always cool to see what Nintendo are going to do next. You know, you, you've seen the Wii controller, that thing's absolutely crazily weird if you think about how it's got a motion then like a then like a like a a nunchuck stick thing i don't know what it's called in like one hand and then now they've just released you know the switch where you can physically take off the controllers and have like one in each hand it's like yeah. their I'm brains not, I'm not, are I'm crazy not, over there I, i'm not a fan of them tiny little controllers you know you know what it works i absolutely it, love them you, you're a fan oh yeah i love them i okay so i have I have pretty small hands. Um, most controllers, it becomes p painful after a while playing with them just because I have to ex overextend my fingers, but these are really nice. It's nice and small and compact, but I guess it could be pretty uh, difficult for people who have larger hands to play with them. Yeah, I, I think it worked like uh, uh, when the Switch first came out. Uh, someone I know brought brought it down to the pub, and we were playing uh, Rocket League in the uh, pub or Mario Kart, something like that. It was great. We were playing that down the pub, but the tiny controller just it just didn't feel right for me. I prefer something yeah. a little bulkier. Maybe not as bulky. You probably wouldn't be able to use this at all, Europa. But does anyone remember the Dreamcast controller? This thing yeah, I, was absolutely I huge. I mean, the Dreamcast was a flop anyway, but still a cult classic for a lot of people. This thing was. Probably the biggest controller I've ever seen in my life. 
<laughs> but uh, if you've never seen it before, because uh, not a lot of people had Dreamcast, give it a quick Google and you'll just see this spaceship of a controller. <laughs> so uh, I think we've exhausted all our talk about controllers at the moment. Uh, I was going to say, that was his own little segment, wasn't it? Keep yeah, it going. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've got all these things planned out, don't you worry. Uh, while we're talking about Steam as well, uh, oh, yeah. we've got some uh, news about Valve. Uh, in July last year, uh, almost almost a year to the day, uh, Valve banned 40,000 Steam accounts uh, for cheating, which made it the single biggest ban hammer in uh, the company's history. Uh, that's changed this week, actually, as Valve stepped up their anti-cheating measures and issued 95,000 bans this week alone, according uh, to data from SteamDB. Uh, I think the official figure was 92,409. Uh, just think of all them skins, uh, PUBG skins, that are just floating around in the air right now that no one can access. CSGO um, skins. And... Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, Is it, um, when you have a VAC ban, does that mean that you can't trade? I imagine so. I've never been VAC banned because I'm not a scumbag, but... Uh, yeah. It, I'd, I'm not. I'm unsure. I'd, I'd have to look. But honestly, like good guy Valve, you know, cheaters are the worst. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I despise cheaters, and the whole community despises cheaters. There's just no need for it, but it's still there because you know they have that chance to have that power. And you know, yeah, it's just. Uh uh, a lot of people are questioning why now. Uh, Valve hasn't really come out and said what's happened, but it's likely that they've imported a new update to VAC. And it started detecting new software. And that's what it's done. Um, you know, so many people cheat. It's so common for some people. Even streamers have been caught cheating live on stream. Even some top players uh, have been caught cheating. Uh, a lot of people will come out and, you know, claim false positives. Oh, I wasn't cheating and stuff like that. But this, I, I believe in this situation, there's no smoke without fire. You've got something running on your system for that to detect it. Okay, a lot of keyboards have macro commands. Mine does. I don't use them. And uh, macros are... a uh, uh, a point of contention for a lot of gamers you know should some macros be used should some not you know a lot of games have third-party clients well are they allowed because you know they give things that other people don't have access to uh, and it's a fine line when, when we allow modern in games and modern of clients where does utility become cheating uh, and that's the line that each developer's got to come up with. But um, yeah, VAC issuing the biggest ban of uh, ninety, almost ninety-five thousand accounts. Uh, that's a big number. Along with that, speaking of bans, uh, Ubisoft has banned uh, one thousand three hundred Rainbow Six Siege cheaters this week. Uh, they've already <laughs> banned loads of cheaters previously, but what this wave is, um, they've um, banned people that were found to be boosted by the cheaters that they banned previously. Um, so this is an interesting stance. We've never really seen a company come down on people that pay for boosting so much. Uh, League of Legends has done it for a while where if they catch you um, boosting your account, uh, they will just deny you from the end of season rewards, which effectively makes it pointless to boost your account during ranked. Um, yeah, so, I heard some stories about some pro players being, you know, involved in some of those schemes and, you know, charging money because obviously, you know, you're a pro player, you're a big name, you've been in esports for a long time, so you know the deal, you know what's good, you know what, you, you, you know how the meta evolves. So they were offering their services, and there's been stories of, you know, these esports players just being denied entry to the league esports scene. Yeah, you know. I I understand the mentality of why pe you know people want to show off that they're at a certain rank, but the the boosting scene it is very bad because all it's doing is negatively negatively impacting the ranked scene of that game. For yep. example, CS:GO or Rainbow Six games like that. If you've got lower level players in a high level game, it's not going to be the experience that the high level player wants. A high level player doesn't just want to stomp over opponents. He wants to outwit someone who is at his level, if not just a little bit above, because then you can make progressive improvements. If you are playing against people that are far lower than your skill, you're not going to improve. Like, you, you know what? 
Um, sorry to interrupt you, but we have the perfect guest here because uh, Europa was actually involved in esports back in the day. So she's has more experience than me and you combined. So she could probably answer some of these questions. What esport were you involved with um, then? Tell us. Uh, I actually, I used to do, before CSGO came out, that I did a lot of competitions with Counter-Strike Source. And I started in uh, doing CSGO as well. Um, I don't know. I would say for maybe about a good two years of CSGO before I quit doing that. Uh, I don't even know how many hours of CS uh, Counter-Strike that I have, thousands of hours maybe, but it was, I don't know, it's different now than it used to be. Um, it yeah. seems like, it seems like now more people, more people are getting into it because they feel like they can become rich and famous and... Yeah, which is why um, do you think more people boost accounts now so they can show off on streams and stuff like that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I'm I'm not gonna name any names, but there have been people that I know personally that uh, have done that, who have paid to have their accounts boosted so that they're uh, brought up into um, like the global ranks, so that they can compete. And they just weren't any good. Mm, but they did it just because they thought they could get famous off of it because people would watch their stream. It's um, it's kind of one of those things where eventually it will bite back. And eventually people will see that, yeah, this something's not right here. And it, you know, it will just come crashing down eventually. So, I don't know. It's I mean, a it's always easy situation. to spot, like, if, as a, as yeah. a, you know... I usually sit as a mid-ranked player in games. I'm never a top-tier player, but I'm never a bottom-ranked player either. I usually find myself sitting in the middle ground. And oh, really? I thought I thought you, I thought you were a pretty bad player. Yeah, yeah I am pretty bad, but you know, I've got to glam it up because <laughs> it's a podcast. Um, so I often see um, people that because you get rewards for being higher rank, whether it be a skin yeah. or a looking game. You see that at the lower ranks, and it's instantly obvious that's what's happened there. It's been a boosted account. It's come oh, back yeah. and, you know, it's into the rank season. It's come tumbling down the rankings, and there we go. So it's pointless. It's plainly obvious who boosts your account. Stop doing it. I understand pro gamers want to make money because it's hard to make money in the gaming scene at the moment. Uh, especially on Twitch and YouTube. It's so competitive and everyone's looking for that way just to earn a little bit of money playing games and doing what they love. It's proper ruthless out there nowadays, yeah. especially for esports players, um, you know, relying on winning tournaments for the most part because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of them ha like still haven't adopted that monthly, you know, payment system for yeah. players where they actually give them a but salary. It's, it's less than it is, as you say, and a lot of players do get salaries now. And mm -hmm. streaming does provide them an easier platform to earn money. But um, for newer people up and coming, they don't have access to that, which is why they're resorting to these measures. And let us know in the comments down below your thoughts on this, by the way. We always want to open up a discussion in the podcast. Uh, and speaking of the discussion, I should probably uh, load up uh, last week's podcast and have uh, a look at the comment section. You could probably hear my mechanical keyboard clicking away in the background. I would apologise, yeah. but I absolutely love my mechanical keyboard. So many people moan about me. Like, oh, right, I can up, hear shut you. Up, shut up. Get out. I can hear you typing right now. Shut up. Right. I just want to point out that, oh, well, you know what? I actually want to apologise to Lunch Money because I felt last week was a bit of a shambles with the quality. So... Uh, we've been in talks of lunch money and we want to actually get him back on the podcast at some point and maybe, you know, have him as, uh, you know, a guest that comes on, you know, more often than others because he seems really up for it as well and we flow together really well as well. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, so I'd be brilliant to come back on. Uh, so comments from last week, uh, Mike the Roman says, uh, if you guys have Steam, can I add you on it? Yeah, sure. Just uh, I'm Sneaky Vale on Steam and Ziklag is Ziklag. Um there's also, we'd appreciate if you followed the Sneaky Bros group on Steam as well. I've done some curator content on there as well, which I'm going to keep pushing, especially as they're going to keep updating the curator system on Steam. Uh, yep. Jimmy G says, hold tight, man, like Jim G plays. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, you gave us a nice donation. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Sawtooth says, It seems you guys have a love-hate relationship with Peter Molyneux, and it also seems <laughs> no matter what you guys seem to give the guy, all the bad luck, thus why he never shows up. Uh, another yeah, game that was a flop was Cube World. No one talks about that thing anymore. Oh, yeah. I, you know what? I saw that comment. I was like, why didn't we bring it up? It's, it's, it's one of those games where not many people like talking about it nowadays. Yeah. Really weird because I'm not sure if you if you've ever played Cube World, but it but it was meant to be this new Minecrafty game where yeah. you know it's obviously a, you know a world full of cubes, but it was more adventure, it was more action, so uh, it it had a lot of promise. I don't I don't know why the dev just buggered off somewhere, but he had a good game going there. Mm -hmm. um, he also mentions demos in his comment as well. He said the best demo he ever got was Age of Empires that was in a cereal box. I think that's amazing. <laughs> if if I was pouring pouring out some cornflakes and Age of Empires fell out, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> you know what? Um, I remember <laughs> Midtown Madness demo. Do you remember? That? Oh, what a game that was! What a literally game that had. Was. I think we liked it so much because there were not many open world driving games around at the time. And yeah, it, in the grand scheme of things, now it's not open world, but you could go off the beaten track and just mess around and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, he also says, "I remember what it feels like to." Uh, to render super slow, which means, I was wondering if anyone would comment on this, it means he listened right till the end of the podcast, because when I played the outro, I muted both yourself and Lunch Money, and then just yeah, I thought, we were like, I thought for we a laugh, like, I'd just unmute it at the end, right after the uh, right. outro, and you're talking about like uh, week two when it took, or week one when it took me ages to render the podcast, so yeah, well done Saw 2 for listening right to the end, so always listen to the end of the podcast, you never know if there's going to be any easter eggs in there. <gasps> yes, easter eggs, Look at that easter eggs in this podcast, so you're going to have to watch this over and over and over again to find all the hidden easter eggs, all the hidden codes and messages that we're going to leave in here somewhere. Yeah, we're going to be talking about easter eggs <laughs> later on in the show. And that's, mm -hmm, uh, yeah. we're going to be talking about some of our favourite ones and most memorable ones over the year. But I, uh, uh, before before we move on to that, we're going to carry on with some gaming news. Is that what you were going to say? Yeah, I've got a story. Um, you you were probably going to bring it up because it's quite a big thing. Is the new No Man's Sky update? We talked about it last episode. And no Man's Sky Next has been praised by fans and the communities uh it on steam you know it went from having a thousand con concurrent players to over forty thousand concurrent players on steam which is a massive boost for the game the community is slightly uh having more faith in hello games and what they're doing to it and it's looking like it's going in a good direction yeah i think this was always going to happen with no man's sky i think they've done great as developers we said it last week in the podcast they've kind of knuckled down they've accepted they made a mistake they they've communicated this um well with the community they got too caught up in the hype initially and the, and they've brought out a game that is actually worth playing uh it, it is a bit odd though it's obviously just released on xbox uh it obviously <laughs> launched as a playstation exclusive um uh sorry uh, sony for that one your mistake on that um, <laughs> but uh, the price points are so weird for the game you've got like a 60 dollar game that's on Xbox. Uh, what is now probably a twenty dollar game on uh, PlayStation and twenty twenty six dollars for PlayStation Plus members, I believe, right now. Yeah, and um, weirdly, um, the pre owned version is uh, more expensive than the new ones on some gaming stores on PC, uh, not PC on, on, on PlayStation, which is very strange. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so it's released to critical acclaim for now, actually. if They just need to keep this momentum flowing now and yep. see what they can do. Obviously, multiplayer is the big thing, and people wanted that all along. I'm still not... I still don't want to give them my money because of the abysmal not watch. Yet. But I'm slowly moving in there. Uh, Europa, did you get caught up in the No Man's Sky hype initially? No. You know, I don't pre-order anything anymore and i haven't pre-ordered anything since um fallout 3 that was uh oh and skyrim those were the only two games that i that i have pre-ordered hashtag don't pre-order um, video games yeah yeah I mean, no kidding because i mean okay so look at it look at it this way uh no man's sky when it first came out uh, just at the local stores here they were 60 dollars um 
I don't know what it was, maybe like two or three months later, they dropped down to like 20 and $30 because they were trying to sell their stock and nobody was buying the game because of how bad it was. So I, yeah, no, no. And I, I think, what was the guy's name? It was uh, Sean, Sean, is it Murray. Sean, Sean Murray. Sean yeah. Murray, yeah. The uh, new Peter Molyneux, in my opinion. <laughs> you know, to, to be honest with you, like, he seemed kind of shifty with some of the interviews that I watched. Oh, yeah. So, I don't know. I just had a feeling that he wasn't exactly telling people the truth about uh, what the game features were going to be. He just... Um, kept going back and forth you know what i mean he wouldn't give a, a definitive answer on on what the gameplay was going to be like mm -hmm. uh what the multiplayer was going to be like um I, I vaguely remember him talking about how uh the the multiplayer in the game was just going to be this awesome thing where you were going to be able to talk to people and have friends play with you and then it was just non-existent so so while we're talking about this do you think we are more accepting of mediocre releases now than we once were? For example, oh, yeah. you just mentioned multiplayer not in the game. Uh, the Crew 2 recently released, and I was talking about it and saying, you know, it's a, it's a decent game. There is a big flaw to it, though. The multiplayer is not in the game at launch. And we're talking about a serious? we're talking about a multiplayer racing game at the moment, and they're only talking about quarterly updates. I've only just found this out because I didn't I didn't look for multiplayer when I bought the game, and I've only just gone <laughs> to find multiplayer, and it's not in the game, and it's not scheduled. That's to release ridiculous. Even for the first quarterly update, it's not scheduled to come out till Christmas. Now they're going to lose wait, wait, a wait. huge player base in that wait, time. Wait, 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 wait. Is it? Wait, so you, you can't invite your friends? You can invite your players, you can invite your friends to your crew. So that this is different. So when I say multiplayer, I mean PvP. Um, oh, okay. So you can invite players to your crew, and that's kind of the point in the game. You can do cooperative missions, and obviously you can make your own races with friends and stuff like that. But in uh -huh. fact, PvP, so uh, a lobby queuing up to play with other people, which was a big part I played in the crew one, uh, is yep. not in the game and will not be in the game for six months. But, I'm sorry, but a racing game that doesn't allow you to race with people over, you know, the country and around the world is a shambles. You know what I mean? We've yeah. we've mastered this technology in the nineties for Christ's sakes. Yeah. Uh so I, I think we are more accepting of games that are lesser complete than we once were. Developers you know why? developers know it's that they can push out updates whenever because that's now a thing. Back in the day it had to be complete because you couldn't push up out updates. I feel like Steam Greenlight has really like screwed some of this yeah. uh, gaming industry up. I, I, I feel like I think we became more accepting as well. Um, Minecraft was the big one. We all, as a community, accepted that we were buying into a bare bones basic game that had pretty much no content, and it was going to be developed over time, and it's still being developed today. Okay, it had an official release, but that official release to me didn't really mark anything. It's still mm. just another patch and another growth of that game. Other games since then have seen how well Minecraft did in this um, pre-release, early access, developer build, whatever you want to call it. And they're all adopting this business model to the point where, in fact, games that say official release push out are missing big features. But they know they can win people back with a big patch, uh, a big news article. Oh, you know, this fix is coming to the game. And I, I, th I think we're the only ones to blame for this because we buy these things. Um, we do, yeah. But it's also, right. it's also the power of the system we've got because we've got instant access to stuff. Like, uh, uh, you know, literally going back to my previous point, a game had to be finished if it's pushing out to CDs on the shelf um, before yep. the days of internet updates and stuff like that. I mean, look at ESO back in the day and um, Age of Mythology. That had barely any patches. I mean, this was the first sort of big multiplayer game I played. And it had, what did it have, six patches? Six, seven major patches and stuff like that. How many patches do games get now after launch? It is, you have a day one patch, and then you'll have a, you know, a couple of days later, you'll have minor bug fixes, and then that'll continue henceforth from that point. Mm-hmm. 
I think it's because games nowadays are getting, you know, more complex, so there's more systems that could easily break. But I wanted to touch upon, uh, have you heard about Star Citizen and the development of that game? Uh, I haven't, but I know the whole fiasco behind it, that it's never going to get released, basically. Yeah, like, uh, it was set for release in 2014, I believe. I could be wrong there, but yeah, I, I believe it was initially going to be released in 2014. Basically, it's a crowdfunded game. It's had almost 2 million... 2 million, let that figure sink in, from fans of the game that have contributed their cash for the development of that. 200 million. That's for a ridiculous... It's, it's the most crowdfunded game in existence. And I don't think it will ever be topped. That's just an enormous number to think about. That was just given to the devs. And they've still not released a game four years later. Yeah, you could get yourself uh, in... fancy spaceships, couldn't you, and all that sort of stuff, uh, funding it. Yeah. I think there's, uh, to, to touch on this, I think there's one system that's been doing really well with this. Um, it's actually the Switch. I've been playing a lot of the Switch recently. They, as far as I can see, they are not doing uh, alpha releases or anything of that nature. They're going back to what I saw a lot of in like the early and late 90s where game companies would release a demo of the game where you play like the first 30 minutes of the game. Uh, and then at that point, if you decide you like it, you can go and buy the game once it's fully been released. So, Yeah, uh, people give Nintendo a lot of flack for not releasing a lot of things on their console or, or allowing people to release it. But they curate a lot of their content so you know stuff that's going to be on there is going to be half decent i mean look at the i mean i can't speak for playstation because i don't own one but the especially in the 360 get in, in the 360 days uh, it's still the case now on the xbox store there is so much shovelware on there some of the games are just poor uh, they're quickly made they're pushed out with a catchy title to bait you into buying it uh, and then you're just left with a with a bare bones game, I'm not sure what it's Steam like on the, the PlayStation. Worst, yeah, yeah Steam's w even worse than that. Um, there is... PlayStation have a bit more stricter rules. So, for example, they don't allow early access for the most part yeah. at all. You know, they the they, they say to they... devs that they you know you need to have a solid product here before mm -hmm. it can go on the shelves of Sony. Uh, the only one I, I've seen them. Uh bend those rules for was Fortnite. Yeah, yeah, but obviously, you know, that's just a ATM cash machine. That is, they had no choice. Yeah, yeah they, 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 yeah, as you said, it's an ATM Fortnite, so they got to get it on there. Um, one thing is a big problem with Steam as well that they still got to fix is the new releases pages of Steam. So uh, I'm yeah. not sure if you know what happens, but developers push their game out to the new releases page of Steam. They then take their game down and re-release it so it appears back on the new releases page of steam also that's why that's been happening you know what i've been seeing that happen every now and then i'm like wait it has not already released you know because i i saw it for h1z1 i saw it for infestation it's it seems like they're like rebranding the name and then just re-releasing it just so it can i just don't think they even have to do there. that it just it, they can physically just take it off steam for a short while add it back to steam and it will pop up in the new releases section because it's obviously just, just set to most recent upload so they're going to have to start coming down on developers that are doing dodgy stuff like that obviously we're to blame as consumers for allowing it to happen but developers have really got to look at their marketing and games companies that openly say we don't do dodgy things are, are getting the best reception from people so uh, mm -hmm. I think things will change. It's going to hit a breaking point. There's going to be another big scandal, I think, with a huge release of a game. Uh, I think it's going to take a big one, say, like a Call of Duty or a Battlefield, something on that scale. Okay, but a bad... Um, uh, the Star Wars one... Battlefront. Uh, Battlefront 2 was a huge flop. Uh, that had its big thing. And I thought that was going to be the changing point, but it's not quite done it. Um, okay, there's a lot of legislation has, coming has... in with loot boxes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a pretty big topic. Um, I was going to talk about. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, with obviously loot boxes being made illegal in some countries. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's not... It's platforms like Steam that have got to curate some of this content just that little bit more. It's physically impossible to do. 
um, because there is so much that's released all the time. But they've got to take a bit more due care, I think, to uh, not allow too much rubbish onto their platform. And I, I can foresee a platform stepping forward. Um, maybe a company like Discord would step into the game distribution market and you know, really curate content, and that could start pulling things away from Steam. And it, nothing will cause Steam to crash and burn unless they switch off the servers. Even then, someone would open up <laughs> fan servers or, or, or anything else. But um, <laughs> fan uh, servers. It, it would, yeah, I think something's going to shake up the market in the next couple of years, and, and it will really change things. I mean, they they did fix up the front screen of the new release page. I'm not sure if you noticed, but it's now not all releases. It's it's new releases that are trending and selling. So you don't get all the shovelware on your screen. But it's also a negative because you have those indie devs out there and they talk about this. This is a huge problem with the gaming industry. It's so hard nowadays to, to get your game noticed because there's so much shovelware, like you said. There's so much crap now in the market that, you know, it if you have a half decent product or a half decent idea that's you know getting there but it needs that push you know it needs that little investment it's so hard now to get it in front of the consumers uh, i mean you're signed up to a press release website where you get sent steam uh, keys and stuff like that mm -hmm. there's so much junk that's sent through these systems because everybody is doing it it's just uh, it's just a nightmare but, yeah uh, um go on. talking about uh, how we get given keys. We've got a new segment to the podcast. We're going to see how it plays out. This is kind of like the trial version. I haven't got a jingle, but would you like me to do a live jingle right now? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Are you ready for this? Uh, it's time to switch it up. We're tired of the sausage fest, so we've got a grill in to switch it up. There you go. Wow. <laughs> wow. Thank you. The production value <laughs> is we're crashing and burning. Go on. All right, so I'm just going to talk about a few indie games, actually. Yeah, so we've been given keys uh, not just for Steam, but we uh, get them for PlayStation, for the Switch, things of that nature. Um, we do have some bigger games that we've been given access to. Uh, some of them have been early access, so we get them uh, anywhere from a couple days to a few weeks before they're released. Um, one of them that I want to talk about it is called, uh, I think I'll do the bigger one first. It's called Smoke and Sacrifice. So this game, um, I didn't really have a lot of uh, big expectations going into this. Uh, it looked a lot to me like uh, Don't Starve, if you've ever played that game. It's a... Uh, like a, a dark survival cartoony kind of game, uh, somewhat open world, but it didn't really have too much of a story to follow. Um, the difference with Smoke and Sacrifice, uh, it's still the open world um, RPG type of game where you explore different ecosystems, uh, but this is very story driven where everything that you're doing in the game, there's a reason that you're doing it which is something that I really like. I'm, I'm really into story-driven games. Um, so you get to craft. Uh, it's got a really awesome fighting system as well, where you can either craft your weapons or use things that are in the world to help you or to give you an advantage over the, the fights that you have to engage in. Uh, they have little mobs around the world, and they also have bigger boss fights, which are pretty fun. Um, it's always changing too. It seems like uh, the mobs are always randomly spawning. Uh, I've not quite beat the game yet. It seems like it's a, a pretty decent game I, in the sense of the length of the game. It, it seems like a lot of indie games, they uh, cut it short or it's not quite long enough, but this one seems to be pretty good. Um, Let's see, this was released by the publisher Curve Digital, uh, developers Solar Sail Games. I, I've not heard of either one of those two before, but they did really, really well with, with the game. Uh, the graphics look really nice, too. They're really clean. Um, yeah, I don't know what else to say about the game. It's a good so, one. You should check it out. So what's that called again for the viewers? 
Uh, it's called Smoke and Sacrifice. Smoke and Sacrifice. So yeah, if you want to pick that yeah. up, uh, Europa says that it's a great game to pick up on the Switch. It's worth a go. If you're a fan of that 2D top-down survival game, definitely pick that up. Yeah, survival games make it a bit of a comeback recently. So uh, they are. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm enjoying it. Obviously, we've mentioned in previous co- podcasts we're back on Daisy and stuff like that. I, I'm feeling. Oh, yeah. I'm feeling. I want to. I want to purchase an, another survival game, and I'm not sure what setting I'm fancying, but I, I'm feeling a, a proper hardcore survival game. I think it may be the forest or something like that. I think I'd really enjoy that. Are you the played forest the forest? Is... Have you? It is. The Forest is an interesting game. It's, you know what, growing up, uh, having the TV show Lost, that has, it's still my favorite TV show of all time. I mean, you've watched it yourself and you've uh, seen another life, brother. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, (laughs) The Forest is probably the closest you're going to get to a Lost game. It's superb. You're on this island, plane crash, and you just got to survive. And there's cannibals, and there's a lot of secrets, so I'm not going to spoil it because it is worth the purchase. If It's usually on sale as well, so that's definitely a good time to pick it up. And it's co-op of up to like three people, I think, so you can have a good time. Yeah, definitely have to and check it's that out. a lot better than it used to be, for sure. Oh, yeah, and it's finally fully released as well. It has an ending. It's another fully ga- released. Another game that was stuck in uh, <laughs> early access beta for ages uh, speaking yeah. of beta though uh, coming oh, yeah. in october exclusively to xbox one is the fallout 76 beta wow yes do you know what um in the previous episodes i was hyping up about 76 saying that i was actually going to follow it you know what there's been a fan-made trailer called fallout miami this is a mod that is being developed by a whole group of guys. And that mod This is on my list. You're, ru- than... you're ruining my content list. This is on my <laughs> list. <laughs> I could read your mind. So, yeah, honestly, Fall- Fallout Miami, a mod, looks better than 76, in my opinion. Yeah, it... it <laughs> yeah. God damn it, you've ruined my content stream. Anyway, <laughs> no, but yeah, I was ruined just the about... Flow. To, you have ruined the flow. Um, yeah, someone <laughs> spent a lot of time on this Fallout Miami mod, and... It looks interesting. It's almost going to be a standalone game from what I've read about it. Mm-hmm. Everyone's quite hyped for it. It'd be interesting to see what it's actually like when it comes out. I'll play both because more Fallout content is only good. It means I'm going to have to buy Fallout on the PC, um, which oh it, it's it's on offer on that many things. It'll be fine. But uh, no, it's interesting they've released uh, a beta exclusively to a console. That's strange. But then again... Microsoft did secure the PUBG early release on the Xbox as well. Uh, they've mm-hmm. got a very good uh, marketing team, shall we say, at Microsoft. I they think do, it's, yeah, I I it's going to be a great they, game regardless anyway. Yeah, I mean, they managed to snag PUBG and No Man's Sky just now, and now they're snagging uh, you know, early releases for Fallout 76 and yep. first time getting on the beta because also... At E3, Todd Howard actually walked on to the Microsoft stage first to announce yeah. Fallout 76. And then, obviously, he did the Bethesda conference. Indeed. Uh, I'm just going to call it now. I'm, I'm just going to call it. There's going to be microtransactions. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just going to call it. 100%. If, I hope not. If, yeah, it depends what we can buy. You know, if, if it's funny, little quirky things, I really won't mind at all. You know. I think, I, I think they said there will be cosmetics. Yeah, Cosmo- cosmetic microtransactions for me, fill, fill your game with cosmetic microtransactions, I really don't care, as long as your game is decent, um, you know, I'll, I'll dress up in a funny hat any day, but, <laughs> yeah. I, I doubt it's just going to be uh, cosmetics, I mean, just look at Fallout Shelter, it, it started with just being little cosmetic things. And then it turned into like a game, like pay, pay to skip, yeah. But, but games, oh, games yeah. like that have that business model that just works for that, and because it's a mobile game, that kind of industry allows for it. So I'll say, as long as it doesn't progress into the main game. Speaking of releases, though, and trailers, uh, this is a game I know you'll be able to talk about in great deal as well, Europa. Overcooked 2 uh, released another trailer this week on their YouTube channel. It looks oh, yeah, baby. absolutely chaotic. <laughs> um, anyone who's played the original Overcooked will know it's broken up marriages and friendships, and it is still doing that today. Um <laughs> It is a, for those of you who have not seen it, uh, we've talked about it before on the podcast, you're in a kitchen, 
um, and you've got to make various dishes for your customers, wash the plates and stuff like that, which sounds very mundane, but throw a pirate ship or a moving vehicle in there, or throw in wacky characters and a time scale, and you've got the makings of a very chaotic cooperative game that is absolutely fantastic. And from the outset, it doesn't look like it's going to be anything fun, but you'll find yourself on level 50, like trying to get them three stars still screaming at each other because because <laughs> no one's serving up the tomato soup the tomato soup is going to burn someone get the tomato soup quickly um <laughs> and then you're about to serve up the tomato soup and you realize you haven't got any plates why is no one doing the washing up someone needs to do the washing up but i've got to chop more mushrooms because i've got to do a mushroom soup that's got to go out now this is pretty much the conversations that you're going to be having when you're playing overcooked and if you want a couch co-op game i fully recommend buying it because it is just the most fun you'll have from a couch co-op game and you know what it's i love about that game go on, go on go on is that there's unit collision in that game so if you're playing cop <laughs> and you like bash into it oh it's the most frustrating like, thing ever you'll be carrying like, like a suit each other flying. <laughs> you'll be carrying a soup and obviously when you get a bit more um into the game you can like uh, run around the kitchen and it, it's not a standard run you have to tap it constantly to have like short bursts so it means there's a bit of a skill to it and if you collide with the other player that's in the kitchen, you just knock each other totally off balance. And it's like, you can just be like chopping a mushroom or something like that and just get flung across <laughs> the kitchen or into the water, you know, because you can, if you, if you fall off a cliff in the game and stuff like that, yes, you're cooking on the side of a cliff and stuff like that. Uh, it, you have like a five second penalty before you can't cook, which is devastating because then one guy's left cooking on his own. Um, so it's, fantastic. It's, it's so much fun. Um, Team 17 are publishing this game. Uh, they published the original one, but they've also been involved with development this time as well. And Team 17 are one of my all-time great studios. I mean, they were producing games for the Amiga back in 1991. Their first game oh. was uh, Full Contact uh, by Team 17. Uh, you'll know this one, Ziklag. Uh, in 1993, they released the uh, 2D platformer Super Frog. Um, yes, that was a year before uh, I was born. Yes, um, and I had an Amiga growing up, and it was one of my favourite 2D platformers, and I've played the um, remake of it that they released on Steam recently, and it's terrible. So I went to uh, GOG, <laughs> good old games, and uh, got the DOSBox version and played the original. And it's one of the hardest platformers I have ever played, and it still remains the hardest platformer. I kind of thought, you know, I played this when I was very young, um, you know, I, was, I wasn't that in, I wasn't like mechanically sound at video games i thought i'll go back to it i'll be amazing and i'm even worse at it than i was back then so uh, <laughs> if you want a really good challenging platform or something real retro get over to gog uh, and download super frog it's an absolutely amazing game from team 17 obviously you can't mention team 17 without mentioning their world famous franchise worms um this game oh it's those guys oh yeah these guys made worms yeah yeah they uh come out with uh worms 2 uh well they had the worms of the director's cut in 1997 uh 1995 was the original release of worms it um what what really helped worms i think it released across so many platforms it was sort of released yep. on the amiga the amiga cd32 uh it released on the atari jaguar the classic mac os game boy uh microsoft dos playstation mega drive sega saturn uh super nintendo and it's, of course, an absolutely fantastic game. You cannot be a bit of worms, I think, sometimes. Yeah, you know, um, sitting at home, couple of beers on the go, some friends round, and then picking on some guy and blowing him to hell. It's just the most fun you'll have in a game. <laughs> yeah, it's caused many arguments. Yeah, Europa and I actually have it on PS4, so every now and then we'll sit down, couch co -op. And we'll have a blast. Well, well, there's that many uh, versions that have come out. I still play Armageddon, which came out back in 1999, and it still stands up as a, a fantastic game. They pretty much yeah. yearly release a version of Worms. Um, uh, open wa Open Warfare was um, a quite a funny one back in 2006. A bit of tongue in cheek against the tongue, uh, the Call of Duty community because in 2007 they released Open Warfare 2. Uh, you can see where they're going with that. Um, <laughs> You know, they've, but they've uh, taken the franchise to all sorts. They've done Worms Crazy Golf. Uh, that was back on the PlayStation 3. Um, and I think the last, no they did um, Worms WMD, uh, which was back in 2016. That was their last Worms release. 
I was going to say, uh, speaking of Team 17, I'm, I'm going to kind of cut in here. I have actually got my second game that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's a little-known game that was published by Team 17 and developed by Villa Gorilla. Uh, it is called Yoku's Island Express. It's a platformer game, uh, but it's not like any platformer game that I've ever played before. It's a pinball and platformer game. Yeah, it's so a very normally, unique. You, like I was watching you play this, and I was mesmerized by the music and the pinball mechanics, followed by pu like puzzle. It's so weird. It's so cool. It's really good. It's. I was really surprised. I thought with pinball, it was going to be something that I only played for like five seconds, and it was done. But I could not put this game down. I think. I think I ended up staying up all night just to beat the game. It was so good. It's an okay, so it's an open world adventure game with pinball. So you're exploring this world as this like little ant and this little ant's a postman. He's taking over in this little <laughs> village. I know it's really weird. But let's it's just like let's weird. just like sink that idea into people's brains. <laughs> an ant meant like an like an ant that's a postman. And Where do people think of these you? ideas? I don't I don't know. So you're you're exploring this little island and the story develops. I'm not going to give away too much, but essentially you have to help save the island and save the people of the island and it's really really good. So you get to go back and forth between the island and discover these little secrets and um meet all these different characters and and the story is actually between the different characters are pretty good even though some of them um, might be really minor in the grand scheme of things in the game. It was very well done. The dialogue's great. Uh, like Zeklak was saying, the music on it is just amazing. Um, you get different abilities that you can use. There's boss battles. Um, yeah, it's it's a fantastic game. I really liked it a lot. It was uh, one of the games that we got... Um, Mm -hmm. From uh, the devs of Team 17. Yeah, from the devs. Yeah. Publishers, should I say. Yeah, Team, Team 17 are big yeah. publishers as well as um, game developers. Uh, one big game they did develop, that which we haven't mentioned, actually, is The Escapist. And, of course, uh, the uh, the sequels to that, The Escapist, The Walking Dead, and The Escapist 2. A uh, hugely okay. popular strategy role-playing game. Single player, uh, of course, but... Uh, a very well received game i think on metacritic it got 71 out of 100 on um pc and uh, yeah, GameSpot the, giving it 8 out of 10 for the second game it's now actually co-op so you can either do local or couch co-op and you can escape prison with your mates yeah, it's a, a, a brilliant game, and uh, yeah, Team 17, one of my favourite uh, development studios. Uh, as you said, they do publish a lot, and they've got loads uh, more games published uh, pu to publish in the lineup. and I can imagine they're uh, probably developing another Worms game as it is, because why not cash in on that big uh, big IP that uh, is, is just uh, keep growing? I, I think it is a timeless game regardless, because you can convert it to 3D, oh, yeah. modern graphics, all sorts of stuff. Um, so we mentioned Easter eggs earlier and stuff like that, and yes, uh, we did. Yeah. There's been some huge Easter eggs in games over the year. We haven't got too much time to talk about it on the podcast, but um, I, I want to talk about um, the Halo Three Easter eggs because oh, yeah. Halo Three was full of Easter eggs, and there were all sorts of crazy ways uh, to access the Easter eggs. But there was a and, and there was a group of people that were collectively um, trying to uh, unlock these Easter eggs, and, and they thought they'd got them all. Um, but then back in 2012, uh, John Cable of uh, Bungie confirmed that in the game's code is still one final Easter egg that nobody has found. Wow. So a further seven years after the game was released, um, it was found in July 2014... Uh, the Easter message reveals Happy Birthday Lauren on the Halo loading screen. And to activate this message, you must set the... It must be December 25th. So it only happens on Christmas Day. Uh, obviously, you can set your game console to that day. On that loading screen, uh, you must press and hold both thumbsticks down. And then the it kind of... Uh, 
goes into like a, a circular it's not very obvious that it, it is doing that and it sort of slowly zooms out and you can see a bit more of the screen and if you look ever so carefully you can see that easter egg which was officially the final easter egg in the halo games so it took that many years to find all the easter eggs in halo that's nuts i have you know i have another one because uh what got me on the topic of you know for this podcast was me and your April, we recently watched uh, ready player one and that oh, yeah. film by Spielberg is all about finding Easter eggs. So that's what got me, you know, wanting to talk about this and talking about Easter eggs that weren't found for a long time. Uh, I've got a story here of Batman Arkham Asylum had an Easter egg so hidden that no one found it for six months, not as much as Halo, but it's still pretty, you know, pretty impressive. In fact, a developer, had to reveal how to do it just because he didn't think anyone was going to find it. And in this hidden Easter egg was uh, it revealed plans for a possible sequel game to Arkham City. So, you know, Easter eggs, I feel like, are a big part of gaming and it gets the community talking. Uh, you know, it brings everyone together. You know, everyone's talking about, you know, like like theories, you know, how to do certain things. You know, someone finds like a start of uh, like... A little Easter egg, and then they pass on the information to someone else who could maybe, you know, who could maybe figure it out a bit more. And it's just crazy. And I feel like Easter eggs are kind of like essential to make a good game. You know, I think my favorite Easter eggs were probably the ones that uh, we found together when we were playing Nazi zombies um, in Call of Duty was oh, it Modern yeah. Warfare. Oh, yeah, yeah. I Easter mean, eggs in that was great because so it had the, what I really liked about them Easter eggs is they weren't just in there to reference pop culture or other video games. That was the hidden storyline behind Nazi Zombies. Mm -hmm. And there were so many YouTube channels dedicated to piecing it all together. I remember watching so many YouTube videos of like going through all the history of um, the Nazi Zombie storyline. And people trying to work out what they meant. It hinted at new maps. Uh, it, you know, you, you were talking about, oh, you know, maybe we're going to go to this area next and stuff like that. I think there is an ultimate compilation of all, like, the Nazi zombie storylines so far uh, that someone recently put up on YouTube. Um, and that's a really good way of doing Easter eggs because people who want to invest in the storyline can, can get involved with it and, you know, really go to town on looking for these Easter eggs. And people that just want to shoot zombies can, can do that. And what I like about that as well is you kind of paint the picture for yourself as well. Like I'm sure everyone has their own version of the actual Nazi zombies universe and how it actually happened. So, you know, I, I do like that devs every now and then do hide the story and make the community, you know, try and work out what's actually happening here because it's mental. I think that works well for, for the Nazi zombie storyline though, because it's, it does. It's, it's a conspiracy in itself that, you know, you've got these zombies walking around. So why not let it be a conspiracy in real life where no one actually knows the real version behind it and everyone's got big room. <laughs> there's definitely a guy somewhere in the world that has a room with a big wall on there with all these <laughs> clues stuck and all these pins it's and me. arrows lead to you <laughs> that's where you've been all Some these years in his, uh, in his mom's basement <laughs> the numbers, the numbers. Uh, there's an easter egg here that I think you'll all find funny and we've all played the game maybe not this one it's the first Diablo uh, in the first Diablo game, there are rumors going about in the community uh, about a secret cow level being in the game. Blizzard and the devs found this so funny that uh, they decided to put in a secret cow level in Diablo 2. And what's even more funny is they had to nerf the Easter egg because the cows were so easy to farm experience. Yeah, it, it was a lot of fun, though. It <laughs> yes. was a lot of fun. Yeah, there's been some really funny Easter eggs over the year. Uh, if you fly to the top of the bridge that connects San Fierro and Las Venturas in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, you'll find a sign that says, there are no Easter eggs up here, go away. Yes. You know what? <laughs> Talking about, you know what? In my note section here, I was going to talk about San Andreas because San Andreas is a bit like Nazi zombies, how there were so many mysteries and strange stories online that people were posting about these strange sightings that got everyone talking and everyone hunting. You know, we've got stories of apparently a Bigfoot being San Andreas. And, you know, Rockstar loved it so much that, that they put a Bigfoot mission in Red Dead Redemption. And they also put Bigfoot sightings in the new GTA. And we've got all the stories like aliens being in San Andreas, ghost cars, horror stories of these, like, you know, 
chainsaw guys running after you in the game, you know, and San Andreas is one of those games where in certain areas of the map, it did felt a bit eerie because of all these community-driven stories. Yeah, it's, it's funny. There's been there been some other interesting ones as well. Uh, if you type in the code Dead Space Two, that's T O O, uh, you can skate in Skate Three as Isaac from Dead Space series. It looks really cool. <laughs> they, they, they've really gone to town on that as well. It looks great. Uh, of course, other big Easter eggs that have taken a lot of time. I'm not sure if this would be classed as an Easter egg or more of just a lot of effort from developers. But every single main character that you kill in the Assassin's Creed series is a real historic person. And mm, even yeah. their deaths mirror the exact year and location of where they died. It is as perfect as they can get it in every single Assassin's Creed game. Yeah, I was... I've just been playing through uh, Origins. It's a great game, and uh, I think I've almost completed it. And uh, I'm looking forward to the new one because it's set in uh, in Greece, in Greek. Greek mythology is going to be in there, so I'm very excited. <laughs> very, very excited. Uh, but go on. You, you'll like this one. Um, there was a Easter egg in Alley Noir. Now, obviously, you liked oh, yeah. that game. Uh, yeah, that was great. If you searched uh, one of the bins in Alley Noir. Uh, you'd come across a hat, uh, and that hat belonged to John Marston. Are you serious? Yeah. I did not know about jo this. Jo that was a massive Easter egg hunt. John, John Marston's cowboy hat is in a bin in Aloe Noir. Could you wear it? I'm unsure. I'm not sure about that. Oh, Never man. tried I, it. I, I, I'm going to have to replay the whole you game. You have to play Aloe and... Noir to try and search um, every trash can. So It's in the mission. Um, Hang on, I think I've got it in my notes here. It's in the mission, the silk stocking murder. It's in that case. That's when I you find it. it was. But you know what? Alley Noir was a game that I actually played uh, my mom, your mom as well. We're brothers. Uh, because Glad she, God we finalized that. Yeah, yeah. She, she's a bit of a gamer. She's dabbled in games back in the day. But she really liked Alley Noir just because of the facial uh, animations were so well done that, you know, she loved interrogating people. You know, like I did all the driving and shooting, but we played it together on the couch, and she loved interrogating people. <laughs> it yeah, Halo Noir, when it first came out, was cutting edge in terms of its um, its facial movements and stuff like that. Uh, big pop culture references, though. Um, Borderlands 2. If uh, in the games, uh, I think it's the caverns area, if you go to uh, the some mining tunnels... And you will mm -hmm. come across a hidden chamber filled with badass creepers. And it's oh, actually yeah, creepers yeah. Um, and there's some Minecraft blocks at the side as well. That's funny. That's good. Yeah, Borderlands 2 is just chock full of, of Easter eggs. They're an absolute blast to find. That was one of my favorite things to do on Borderlands. Yeah, I think they've got I've Lord never... of the Rings references as well and stuff like that, haven't oh, they? Oh, yeah, they've got tons. Uh, you know, I, I never really got into the the full storyline of Borderlands 2. I, I didn't really enjoy that so much. But just the Easter eggs alone, I put so many hours into that game just looking for them all. Mm, indeed. It was good. So, so um, do we have a guess the game this week? I was literally just about to bring that up. <laughs> uh, we do have guess the game. I was up last night uh, thinking of it. So it's time to cue the jingle I then. Very motivated. Yes, yeah, play jingle. It's time to play. Guess the game with the sneaky bros and occasionally a guest that has nothing better to do with their life. All right, let's play. Yes, welcome to Guess the Game, the jingle that introduces itself. Ziklag comes up with a game that we have to guess. He changes the rules every week, so we're not really sure what we've got to do. Uh, so I'll let <laughs> Ziklag take it from here. All right, guess the game. You know, uh, it's it's pretty much I'm thinking of a game. So what am I thinking of? I can only answer with yes or no. The rules are the same as last week because I think they worked really well. Lunch Money managed to get the answer, which was poor all last episode. Five minutes on the clock. I do have access to free clues that I can give you in aid of you to get the right answer. But if you ask for a clue, I knock off a minute. You got five minutes. Let me get off the timer. I think um, this game is. I f you both know it, okay? So, is it Star Wars? Uh, uh, yes, you figured it. You figured it out. Hang on. Google <laughs> stopwatch. Here you go. Very well prepared, as always. 
Here we go. Okay, five minutes. Are you both ready? I'm ready. To play guess the game. All yeah. right, five I can't minutes. Tell how excited oh. I am. Yeah, now. <laughs> Here we go. Five minutes on the clock. Yes or no answers. Go on, you're up. You kick off with first question. Uh, is it an action game? Yes, I would say it is. Is it an open world game? Yes. Okay, so he wasn't too sure about that, so maybe it's not dedicated <laughs> to its open world. Um, is it futuristic? No. So is it Four and a half minutes. Is it fantasy? Yes, it is. So it's fantasy. Is it Skyrim? It's not Skyrim, but would you like a clue? Go, go clue. You want a clue? Okay, I'm going to stop the timer. Okay, so that's going to be a minute knocked off. Unfortunately, that does suck. But you do have uh, three minutes and 40 seconds I'm going to give you. So the first clue, listen closely. Uh, talk it amongst yourselves as well. Are you ready? Growing up, I was taught to stay away from anyone calling themselves George. Growing up, I was taught to stay away from anyone calling themselves George. Three minutes, 40 seconds, starting now. Call themselves George. That sounds like a character that's never narrating themselves, maybe, something like that. I don't know. Uh, Is it Fallout 3? No. No, that's Gary, not George. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Can we just go in with another clue? Yeah, sure. I'm going to stop the timer. So, you you know, you now have 2 minutes and 20 seconds on the clock, so we're getting closer. This is this might be a bit hard. So, this is going to be uh, a big one. Sometimes I get rewarded. Sorry, what? wrong. What? Wrong. What? What's wrong clue is that? Wrong. Sorry. Here we go. I must rescue my trapped frozen family. <laughs> I must rescue my trapped, frozen family. Here we go. <laughs> Two minutes, 20 seconds. I must rescue my um, trapped, family. Is it Fallout? No. <laughs> the, the new one? No, I already said is it, that. Is it, a Beth uh, is it a game developed by Bethesda? No. No. Okay, no. let's write them off. Um, okay. Uh, I must rescue minutes. my trapped, frozen family. What? Let's have the final clue. Final clue. So... You're going to have one minute on oh, the clock. Us. One minute on the clock. Your final <laughs> clue is, I love to run around and headbutt. Sometimes I get rewarded with treasure. One minute on the clock. What? I love to run around and headbutt. Is it pirate themed? No. Um... What? I love to run around and headbutt. <laughs> You're gonna you're gonna kick yourselves. Come on, you got forty five seconds. Absolutely no idea what you're going on about. Is Come it, on. Is it got a big multiplayer is, scene to it? No. Is it Sonic the Hedgehog? No. It was a good answer though. Uh is it Crash Bandicoot? No. Good answer. Oh, I know what it is. It's Spyro the Dragon. It is Spyro the Dragon. Woo! Nice one. I wasn't <laughs> expecting you to get that. What kind of gave it away? Hey, I was just... I was actually... You know what? When when, when Angela uh, Europa uh, said um, Sonic the Hedgehog, I then, and your your reaction gave it away that you were like, oh, good answer, which is why I said <laughs> Crash Bandicoot. So I was thinking 3D platformers from that era. Yeah. And then I suddenly thought, Spyro, yes, you run into headbutt things to get treasure, yeah. So, and the whole George thing was obviously, I was talking about Saint George, who obviously slay dragons, uh, which is some of the law with the UK there. So that was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a weird clue. I, I wasn't expecting you to get it from that clue alone. But Frozen Family, obviously, in Spyro, you're, you're obviously trying to save your own kind, because they're all frozen. And then obviously, you, you, yeah. You know, you headbutt a lot, and you get and you get treasure from it. Yeah, you so always headbutt the dragon. You always headbutt accidentally in Spyro the Dragon as well. It always you, <laughs> you, you do, yeah. You, you, you try and speed through a level, like yeah, I'm just gonna run past all these enemies, and then you'd hit something. You just like, oh no. Uh, the remake's <laughs> coming out soon though, Spyro. So looking forward to that. It um, is, yeah. You know what? Guess the game. It's getting good. You know, twenty seconds on the clock, which was the same time that you that uh, that lunch money got it as well. 
uh, we're just too good at this. It's great. Yeah, um, I'm going to have to make it harder. <laughs> Even harder. <laughs> no, it was a good one. I did enjoy that. So, uh, yeah, it's only because I got the answer right, though. I would have been raging and <laughs> I got the answer. <laughs> um, so, does anyone else have anything else they would like to talk about this week on the podcast? Um, I mean, I did say about Ready Player One. Uh, Europa and I watched that, and that had so many IPs. I don't know how Spielberg got that many IPs into a film. There were so many references to different games and different films. It was like, you know, there was Master Chiefs in there. There was Tracer from Overwatch. There was the T-Rex. I have, I have the book Kong. up here, Ready Player One, actually. It's a really good novel, so I, I really want to yeah. watch the film. I, I actually know someone cause, uh, who accidentally walked onto the set of Ready Player One. Really? Because uh, they filmed here in the Midlands. They, they filmed some of it in Birmingham. Um, All right. And he, uh, she, she put on Facebook that uh, it's not every day you accidentally walk onto uh, a Steven Spielberg set. And it was about the time they were filming Ready Player One. Um, I'm not sure what scene. Uh, they, they film all over. But, uh, yeah, that's a random bit of pointless trivia uh, for you there. So I think it's probably time to end since we're, uh, we've are we got things yeah, like that. Yeah, we're rambling now, aren't we? So, yeah, we are rambling, which always happens towards the end of the podcast. So all we can say this week, thank you very much uh, for tuning into the podcast. Do make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon as well. And leave a comment because we do talk about all the comments in the podcast. Thank you for making it through this far. We are looking to get the podcast on other available services so you can take it uh, wherever you go. Uh, it's a little bit harder than I initially thought. Uh, podcasts are a strange beast uh, to master, and I'm slowly getting there. But other than that, all that's left to say is definitely go and play Overcooked. If, if you need a reason to play Overcooked, it has won many, many awards. It won Best New IP at Developer Awards. It won Best Game at the Big Game Awards. It won Best British Game at the BAFTA Gaming Awards. It's developed by two guys. This is the original was, anyway, before Team 17 <laughs> got involved. It won Best Family Game. I'm not sure why, because it's definitely broken up a lot of families. That was at the BAFTAs as well. So it's two BAFTAs this game How has won. How about this whole podcast is just dedicated to Team 17? For I, I, actually Team, 17, nice. Team 17, Peter Molyneux and RuneScape, I think were sorted for the podcast forever then. My brain's going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> that is the dream show <laughs> but yeah if the podcast if we could just play overcooked during the podcast that would be great but we'd just be screaming at each other the whole time we'll get nothing done I wonder if the new one's thank multiplayer you. actually I'm going to have to find uh, that out interesting yeah but yeah thank you to Europa for switching it up with her Switch games thank you for that yeah yeah no problem what the games again for the viewers that uh, were interested um, so there was Smoke and Sacrifice mm -hmm. and uh, Yoku's Island Express, yep, which so... is my favorite out of the two. I absolutely loved it. Okay, so Europa okay. says that there are must-haves for a little adventure on your Switch. Indeed. Uh, so thank you very much. We'll be back at the same time next week. Uh, we do pre-record the podcast, so it usually goes up either Sunday night or Monday UK time, uh, depending on how good YouTube's feeling that day. Other than that, it's uh, all we've got to do now is play the outro, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. See you later, chaps. Bye.
I, I had to keep waking him up. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Why? 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 In case he started like barking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>